Um, so my name is Kate Bowenbeiner and I'm a former senior associate at the, from the Centre for Education and Youth who wrote the chapter in the book called Education Without a Place to Call Home. I'm actually currently doing my PhD at the University of Bristol, but I'm really pleased to have been invited back here today to talk about young people on the margins and just to give you an overview about what my chapter talks about. And because we've got such a small group, we can potentially have um, quite a lot of time for discussion as we go through. Um, so the book chapter is based on a participatory and artistic research project that my colleagues and I worked on with a group of young people who had experienced homelessness. So the research involved young people leading interviews with one another and using photography to share their stories. So what you can see on the screen now is some of the photographs from that research project. Um, I don't have much time now to go into the detail about the methodology for that research project, but if anyone has any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them um, because I think it was a, a really interesting way to do the project and ties into a lot of the things that we were sort of discussing um, in the panel session just now about young people's voice. Um, the chapter itself argues that action is needed to improve young homeless people's access to and experience of formal education. I will tell you a little bit more about um, but before I go any further, I wanted to clarify by what I mean by young and what I mean by homelessness in this chapter. So in the research, um, I define young people as 16 to 24 year olds, largely because experts and the government focus on that age bracket when discussing or researching young homeless people. Um, but the law dictates that under 16 year olds with no home should be supported through social services. Therefore, that group of young people would be counted as being in state care. However, many younger children who are homeless also experience a lot of the same barriers to education that 16 to 24 year olds do. So a lot of the things I speak about today would also be relevant to, to younger children. In terms of what homelessness is, well, homelessness is often equated with sleeping on the streets. But homelessness can take other forms that are often more hidden from view. Um, for example, or young people might experience sofa surfing where they're staying at one friend or acquaintance's house um, one night and then moving somewhere else to find shelter. And um, that would be considered hidden homelessness. But when I'm thinking about what homelessness actually means to the people who experience it, I always come back to this quote from a young person we worked with called Yasmin, who essentially explained that for her, um, homelessness was not having somewhere um, to rest and, and to be at peace. And I'll just give you a few seconds to read through that quote. So in the UK, youth homelessness is a huge issue. In 2018 to 19, 71,589 young people in England approached their local authority because they were homeless or at risk of homelessness. However, government statistics like this are likely to be underestimates because young people experiencing hidden homelessness won't be counted in those statistics. Um, so why does this matter for education and youth? So in the chapter, I argue that youth homelessness is an important issue for the education and youth sectors because the journey towards and the experience of homelessness makes it harder for young people to access education, to benefit from education and to be supported in education. Um, so the young people that we worked with told us about a multitude of events and experiences that led to their homelessness. And something that became important to recognise in these young people's stories was the complex links between structural factors such as poverty, which make it incredibly more likely that someone would experience homelessness. But the link between those structural factors and personal factors such as family relationship breakdown. So those factors that contribute to homelessness also make it harder for young people to access and engage with education. For example, Jerome, who you've heard a little bit about um, in the introduction to this um, session, um, he explains that his experience of living in poverty, being a carer and his grandparents dying contributed to his homelessness. But he also explains how those factors made it harder for him for, at school and how he felt like he did not have enough support. And here's a quote from him um, on the screen now, which I'll give you a couple of seconds to read. Okay. 
So in the chapter, I talk about the impacts of homelessness on education, and I've picked out three sort of key themes that I wanted to talk about today, and they're on the screen there. So firstly, I wanted to talk about the welfare system and how this can actually conspire against young people who are homeless. You can claim universal credit if you're studying or working part time, but you will also be expected to work despite, despite your part time study commitment. And you can be threatened with sanctions if you don't attend um, specific meetings uh, for universal credit. So one of the young people we worked with called Andre told us about how he had been wrongly forced to take on work when he was actually intent uh, supposed to be attending college um, and how that uh, threatening of sanctions and being forced to take on work at, at a time when he was supposed to be studying essentially resulted in him having to drop out of education. You cannot claim a student loan if, you're if you are claiming universal credit. Um, that's another issue. Um, but young, because young people living in supported accommodation and claiming universal credit might need more funds to attend university. So we can see that the actual system that is supposed to support young people experiencing homelessness can actually create barriers to education. Um, homelessness obviously has an emotional impact on young people. And in terms of education, it can also lead to young people feeling like they want to drop out of school or college because they have so much to deal with without sufficient support. Um, it can also lead to young people feeling like education is irrelevant to their everyday lives and the things that they're experiencing. It can also lead to a lack of trust in teachers and school staff, which can lead to problems with behaviour, which in turn can lead to school exclusions, which is, I know is a theme that we've heard a lot about this morning. Um, so a young person we worked with called Emily, uh, she told us um, about how she had a difficult relationship with both her mother and her father and how she struggled to deal with her emotions and that she didn't feel like she had a network of support she could rely on. When her cousin died, she experienced profound grief um, and thus exacerbated her difficulties. Um, so this, was, this manifested in increasingly problematic behavior in school and worsening relationships with teachers. And that culminated in her being excluded from school. Homelessness also has a practical impact on young people's education. Having no space to study at home, having to move around a lot to find shelter and just generally being exhausted can make it difficult for young people to A, travel and get to school or college or education and B, to have the resources and the energy to study. Um, I think this is quite a powerful quote from y Yasmin who it told us about how after sleeping in her friend's car, she felt exhausted and like she just didn't have the passion for education anymore. I'll give you a while to redo that quote. Okay. So the young people that we worked with absolutely had no shortage of aspirations and hopes for the future, um, regardless of their circumstances. So, for example, one of the young people we worked with called Evan explained that his dream was to become an Italian chef, uh, to become a chef in an Italian restaurant, rather. Um, and he had it, and that was despite a history of family conflict and drug abuse. Um, so young people who experience homelessness do not lack aspirations, therefore um, suggesting that boosting aspirations is the solution to the, uh, the issues that young people who experience homelessness doesn't, wouldn't seem to make sense. Um, young people who experience homelessness find themselves grappling with a mix of inequality and injustice and challenging personal and family circumstances. Action is definitely needed to tackle the root causes of the challenges they face, a lot of the structural issues that we were talking about earlier this morning. But policymakers and practitioners can also take practical steps to make education more accessible for young people who experience difficulties associated with homelessness. So what can be done? Well, in the chapter, I present a long list of specific recommendations, but as I don't have much time here today, I wanted to emphasize two key points. 
Firstly, joined up working between the education and youth sectors and other services is vital. Schools come into contact with young people regularly. If they spot the signs of um, homelessness and follow safeguarding procedures, they can help to support young people at an early stage. The second point I wanted to make is that young people who experience homelessness, um, their unequal access to education and training is not inevitable. Policymakers can make changes to the system to A, tackle youth homelessness, but also B, to make sure that young homeless people have access to the resources that they need and that they are being supported to engage with education. And I will leave it there. Um, so I will just stop screen sharing. And then I think we've got about eight, just less than 10 minutes for some questions, if anyone had any. Thanks, Kate. Can you can you talk any more about the um, specifics on on policy recommendations around tackling youth homelessness? So, um, oh, around tackling youth homelessness itself. Mm. So, in the chapter, I've uh, I'm largely talking about um, in terms of recommendations uh, recommendations for in giving equal access and engagement with education for young people in terms of tackling youth homelessness. Um, I mean, we do offer some recommendations about early intervention, um, supporting young people to, um, to uh, overcome challenges with, with family relationships. That's one of the things we talk about in the report, but we also talk about structural factors in, in regards to poverty as well. Um, but the, the, the chapter itself focuses more on policy recommendations to do with education. I think... Um... You know, in our, in in our experience, we spent spent the last year developing this this model. Well, last couple of years, but last year piloting a uh, model to intervene earlier via schools, um, to sort of moving away from uh, an acceptance that uh, neat or free school meal statistics can be used to identify people at risk of homelessness, um, which which is sort of standard practice. Uh, across across Wales, certainly anyway, um, and in looking at different ways to go through schools to identify young people at risk of homelessness and intervene earlier. So I, I think yeah, the, the crossover between education and youth homelessness prevention is a really interesting area that there is there is great scope for further policy intervention there. You know we have uh, that's as somebody said in the chat earlier. There was only, I think, 15% of young people's time is spent at school. Um, and it's, it's great that we're looking around that. And, and that's true, certainly. Um, but schools are an absolutely fantastic place for policymakers to look for ways to interact with young people. You know, the vast majority of young people are going to attend school regularly. Mm -hmm. um, it, gives, it gives us a really good opportunity to, to have contact with young people who otherwise, you know, in the case of those who are hidden homeless, to... The, the, the clues in the name we don't have contact with those young people we, they're not recognized in the statistics they're not coming forward to local authorities to, to present as homeless so we we don't know otherwise so yeah so we've, we've been having some some joy uh working with some schools to start identifying those young people a little earlier putting in those you know as you, as you mentioned the family um family mediation we, we use predominantly as a, a method of, of hopefully keeping young people at home where it's safe and appropriate to do so. Um, yeah, I'd like, I guess I guess my point is that I think I think there is a lot of scope for further work in in that area. Looking what, not not looking at educators to prevent youth homelessness. I think there's teachers have got plenty on their plate as it is, but looking at what can be done within schools and what, while young people are in contact with schools to intervene earlier before this becomes you know, before it gets to the point of someone sleeping in their car while trying to maintain uh, A levels and a job. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. And I think your work in Wales has been um, really interesting. And I'm sure that, um, you know, in, in England that, that we can learn from that as well. And I, and I agree with you that that schools do have a lot of contact with young people and young people that, that other services might not have contact with. So are a, a really important resource in preventing youth homelessness. Can I? I oh, sorry, sorry, you go. 
Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Kate and Lloyd, for the discussion earlier. Um, I have a question about, I think, and, and this is, I think, addressed to everybody who works with um, children and young people, especially those who are at, at risk of being homeless. Um, I think when we talk about interventions such as joined up working or policies uh, that can prevent or support somehow um, the, children, the, the children and young people who are at risk of uh, becoming homeless. I think there is a piece of information that usually gets overlooked. And I wonder if any of you have any insight in this. Um, is there fraud, the, the, the web of support that, that is available right now and the different uh, agents and agencies and, and organizations that deal with children, children and young people, are there any um, are there any gaps in 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 this in this system of support and um, and people that you have identified as being uh, more problematic and needing addressing immediately? For example, um, as an example, um, um, applying for student finance. Um, uh, there was a project I think in Canada that, that, that found that applying for student finance was uh, was was really low because it was too difficult. So the issue was in the application process itself. So they put something in place to support with the application process itself. I wonder if, if it's if you have been able to identify something similar in relation to to home to to to, 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 um, to homeless. So. Um... In terms of gaps in this in the system, I, I don't think maybe as specifically as the, as the um, example that you you just mentioned. But in terms of the welfare system, I think there is a big gap there. In that, you know, in the stories that we heard from young people, people the the staff that they came into contact with um, in job centres maybe it, you know wrongly gave them advice about. Um, not, you know, threatening them with sanctions and saying you, you can't attend your college course because you have to come to this. Therefore, then this young person that I just mentioned, Andre, dropped out of his college course and that wasn't right. So I suppose there's a gap in the system of making sure that the welfare system, the benefit system is working for young people um, and, is, you know, and that we're encouraging um, young people to go into education um, because we, sh we shouldn't really have a system that is, telling young people that they, they they can't go into education or sort of um, encouraging them not to in order to meet the demands of um, universal credit and that and that sanction system and I think that is a big area that, that I would say um, needs a lot of attention we've got, just to say we've got uh, just under two minutes now so uh. probably got time for one more question yeah. uh, so I was thinking about what Hugh said about schools. I used to work at a college for 16 to 18 year olds. And one of the big issues that we had was, was not all, but most of the young people who were uh, homeless, uh, often sofa surfing, uh, were young people that schools didn't really care about. So when they came to enrol with us, we didn't really have that much information about their life at school or they'd come from alternative curriculum projects. And they were often on courses that were lower level courses around construction uh, with staff who came from industry and weren't necessarily um, came from a teaching background. Um, and so that that I suppose that thing about how do we join up that approach that schools pass on that information to colleges. So we as a youth work team were able to support those students best. We often found out about their homelessness part way through you know we saw little signs and asked questions um but that 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 the schools weren't interested in those students so they they don't want them to stay at their sixth form they want to get rid of them and they came to our place mm. i'm really sorry to hear that um that that you know the schools um didn't pass on information about those young people because i think you know the point the point that you sort of raised is is really important that it's about all these parts of the sector working together it's not one it's not schools whole job to prevent youth homelessness it's not youth workers whole job to do that but we're all little parts of the jigsaw puzzle that can support young people um, and I think that's really uh, important for us to remember in terms of what can actually be done um I'd say I Got think just under one minute, Kate. OK, um, I would just say that I think training is a really important thing for all levels of the system. 
um, and awareness about these issues that young people face. Because I can say that as a, as a school teacher, this is not something that I was necessarily, it was definitely aware of youth homelessness from the things my um, pupils experienced, but it wasn't necessarily something that was often spoken about um, in a broader context within the school. 